a lot of what we do is often with more than one response variable is comparing groups, just the sort of thing we were doing in, you know, the sort of uh, linear modeling that we were doing in lab two. And in this case, the example I'm going to well, one simple example is with the two uh, the two turtle shells. So the first thing, and this is a very common way of explaining uh, why we bother to do multivariate analysis when we're comparing groups, because the you know if we were if we had male and female turtle shells uh, and we measured uh, in this case I got to move the annoying zoom thing out of the way. Um, we measured height and length on each of the shells. And you can see I've made a kind of an attempt at a histogram for each of those on their axes. And they overlap a lot. So I might I might do a t-test and not, not really find a difference between uh, males and females in either height or length. And, you know, kind of write my disappointed paper about how there's no sexual dimorphism in painted turtles. But then look at the, you know, I've got the ellipses there that are sort of like the loaves of bread for each um, sorry, for each uh, sex of turtle and they don't overlap at all <laughs> so that that's the point that and for me it's always not so much what's the fanciest analysis I can do but how do I get the most out of the data set so because multivariate analysis is not just one at a time seeing how things are different, but it's considering the correlation of response variables, um, it can be really valuable in showing you things that are going on that you didn't see uh, when you just looked one variable at a time. So the, the sort of questions that you ask, and you know, I use the acronym DFA here, discriminant function analysis, because there's there's a bunch of terms that you're going to hear associated with this if you get into this area. One, as I was saying, multivariate analysis of variance, just ANOVA with more than one quantitative response variable. Discriminant function analysis is kind of a follow-up to that. And it's really, you know, it's, it's kind of like this. You know, I was talking about predict, building a predictive model when we first started talking about the, the linear models. And, um, so imagine that you had measurements of a turtle shell and you want to predict, is it a male or a female? Just using those measurements. And that, in a nutshell, it, in a turtle shell is, is DFA, discriminant function analysis. So it's finding for us with the data that we have here, it's, it's helping us determine whether or not, first of all, is there a statistical difference between these groups with respect to these response variables? And secondly, how? And you can kind of tell, I hope, that in a way it's similar to PCA, but there's a different criterion. We're going to be trying to find an axis again, um, but a different kind of axis. So if we look at this, this uh, you know, we've got the two panini buns here, right, that are male and female turtle shells. And think about if we're doing a PCA on either of those sexes or even the two of them together. I, I guess I'd put a couple of individual points within those envelopes, within those ellipses there. And I've marked the mean of the ellipse with the big black uh, point. Um, so what direction is the PCA, the major gradient gonna be? That's pretty obvious, eh? <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be going, I guess I'm seeing it Everybody's seen it from bottom left to top right. It's just going, it's like, we'll always remember Emily's axiom, you know, it's through the center of the loaf of bread, right? So it's probably not A. <laughs> I don't know why I did this cheesy multiple choice thing. It's B. <laughs> Spoiler alert. And it's definitely not C. So yeah, B is where if we replotted the points along it, um, we get the most scatter along that axis. So that's going to be our, our major gradient in the data. So with DFA, again, we're looking for an axis. We're doing this, but now we've got a different problem. And that is, 
if we replotted the data on the axis, same way we did with the PCA, but this time we want to, the objects along the axis to best distinguish the two sexes. So if you look at this, look at A, look at B, and look at C. And so what I mean by replotting on the axis, let, let's do a C, that's probably the easiest one to conceptualize. So we got a bunch of points within the males and they get replotted on C. So they're all gonna be kind of there. And then the females, they get replotted perpendicularly along that axis C. So they're gonna have this scatter. So notice the two groups are gonna be quite distinct on that axis if we replot them on there. Whereas if we plotted them on B, the principal component axis, they're gonna to be totally overlapping each other. So again, in both analyses, you're looking for an axis. In PCA, you're looking for that axis where you put all the points along and have the maximum possible scatter. With DFA, you're finding the axis where the points best distinguish the groups. So PCA finds axes that describe the major trends in a group of observations. DFA finds axes that describe how the groups differ from one another. So the first thing you ask yourself, and, and there's, you know, just like in ANOVA, there's a statistical way to answer this question, do the groups differ? And so it doesn't look like they differ in this case. Yeah, they probably differ in this case, and they definitely differ in that case. And here's the situation with male and female turtles. And this is an like old time, really crappy three-dimensional plot on the left there. Um, and this is, I think that's, I don't know, this isn't exactly how they're different. We'll get to the actual results in a sec, but I just, what I'm trying to show you here is potential ways that they might be different. How do we figure that out? Well, we do, first of all, we judge whether or not they're different. That's our first question. But second question, which is what's the nature of the difference, if there is one, is just like in PCA, remember when I was interpreting the axis, what role does each original variable play in defining the axis? Uh, that's what I'm doing here. So maybe it's like this, where the males are, just smaller than the females, but they all tend to fall along that, that principal component axis. That's not the way the actual data look. Um, maybe it's like this, where uh, the males are, looks like they're bigger in height, but not so in length than the females. Uh, maybe it's the other way around. And actually this is, this is a pretty reasonable sketch for what the data actually are like. So, and it just shows you that, and this will certainly be true when you do um, an OVO with your data and DFA, that reality or real data is often quite complicated. We've got a couple of things going on here. First of all, the females are bigger than the males. We've already seen that in a couple of other analyses. Secondly, they're differently shaped shells than the males. So the female shells are higher for their length than the male shells. And that's, see the axis that I've got there with the arrow on one end, that's the discriminant axis. So that's the one that if we replotted the shells along it, we best distinguish the two sexes. But, and, and so we can say, yeah, length, has a negative relationship with that, height has a positive relationship with that. But also the other thing going on is that the female shells are just bigger. They tend to be bigger in both length and height than the male shells. 